I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about inflammation and mental health, most specifically about anhedonia. So as usual, I'll start with the take-home message, and that is that inflammation is prevalent in a number of mental health conditions, depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, actually most mental health conditions that have been looked at. Inflammation is particularly strongly associated with one subset of mental health symptoms, and that is anhedonia, which is not being able to enjoy something that's normally pleasurable or not wanting to engage in an activity or partake of a substance that's normally pleasurable. Studies that have shown that if you induce inflammation, that increases anhedonia. Studies also indicate that reducing inflammation can decrease anhedonia and decrease depression, and that it's particularly those with high baseline levels of inflammation that are most susceptible to these inflammatory effects. So I'm going to start with a patient, Anne, short for anhedonia. She was trying to manage her depression with cognitive behavioral therapy and fish oil, and it seemed to be working well for the first few weeks. And then she got sick with a bad flu or cold. She was in bed for a few days, and she felt much worse, and she was terrified that she was falling back into de depression and that the approaches we were using, there were reasons she didn't want to try medications at that point. So she felt that she might have to resort to that. And part of what I told her is that there's a large body of research that shows that feeling lousy physically often leads to feeling lousy mentally. And that even when healthy people are injected with certain cytokines, certain chemicals used by the immune system, when those are injected into completely healthy subjects, so they're not feeling physically lousy, they're not getting fevers necessarily, or or malaise, but you can replicate a number of symptoms of depression, including anhedonia, more negativity of thoughts, fatigue, and some amount of malaise. For Anne, it turned out, as it has with several of my other patients, just knowing that you have a physiologic reason for feeling worse right now sometimes helps block that downward spiral that can happen where someone's worried about feeling miserable and feeding into one of the depressed lies that depression tells you that you're feeling bad now, you've always felt bad, it's only going to get worse, but knowing my body's recovering from this physical illness, I'm going to feel better when that's over, can help get out of depression or help prevent falling into depression. So anhedonia comes from a Greek word meaning pleasure or hedonism or hedon. Anhedonia is the absence of pleasure. And originally, anhedonia in psychology, psychiatry was used to describe just the inability to feel joy when you were doing activities that previously brought you pleasure or were consuming foods or other things that had previously brought you pleasure. And then it was expanded because it was clear that anhedonia had a broader range of symptoms. It wasn't just the inability to feel and enjoy things. It also was wrapped up in motivation and anticipation. So the thought of something previously enjoyable no longer was motivating. And some people have further separated the motivation from sort of an anticipatory aspect of anhedonia to an actual motivation action concept. So again, anhedonia can encompass enjoyment, the liking of something, the anticipation, the wanting to do it, and whether you actually can motivate yourself enough to engage in it. Neuroscience evidence from animals and in humans that the anticipatory part of anhedonia or the decreased anticipation involves hippocampal circuits, also the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and the prefrontal cortex, whereas the anticipatory motivational part of anhedonia is tied in with dopamine reward, reward pathways thought to involve the ventral striatum, and the medial prefrontal cortex. Enjoyment parts of anhedonia are associated with abnormalities in the ventral striatum and the medial prefrontal cortex, while the deficits in anticipatory aspects of reward, that element of anhedonia, are related to abnormalities in the hippocampus, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, and the prefrontal cortex. Dopamine is intimately tied in with anhedonia, and there's evidence that certain cytokines, certain chemicals of the immune system, are particularly target dopamine pathways or interact or interfere with them. Although I've started out by talking about anhedonia as a classic sign of depression, and it is, so it's part of how depression can be defined, an element of schizophrenia. It's one of the negative symptoms 
So not the hallucinations or delusions, but the sort of passivity, the inability to enjoy things. It's also an element of substance abuse where people don't find pleasure or enjoyment in anything other than the substance they're abusing. Feature of ADHD where people find it difficult to motivate themselves for tasks that are important but aren't interesting. It's also present in PTSD, it's present in personality disorders and in eating disorders. And some research groups have gone on to define or study subtypes of anhedonia, particularly social anhedonia, where interacting with other humans isn't particularly enjoyable. That might actually seem to be an element of autism spectrum issues. Social anhedonia is more common among men than in women. And sexual anhedonia, where aspects of sexual participation, behavior, anticipation of it just aren't arousing or exciting. And sexual anhedonia, at least in America, seems to be more prevalent among women. A few studies looking at drugs that seem to target or help reduce anhedonia, so restore enjoyment. And most of these are dopamine agents, so things like amantadine have been used, most often in the setting of depression that summons schizophrenia and other conditions, or drugs like bupropion, which specifically boosts dopamine. Some people believe, some experts said among the SSRI, sertraline or Zoloft has slightly stronger dopamine reuptake action than most of the others, and that that might be a better SSRI for anhedonia than, than the other SSRIs. And recently, with more attention to GLP-1 agonists, the drugs that are being used, like drugs like Ozempic that are being used for obesity and diabetes, at least in some people, that seems to target in the brain enjoyment, anticipation, motivation, circuitry. Now, the connection between feeling sick and depression has been noted for a long, long time. What's called illness behavior in animals seems to mimic depression. So animals, when they are sick, decrease their activity. Most of the time they decrease their appetite for food and water, so they're eating less and drinking less. They withdraw socially, they have low energy, and measurably cognition is altered. So those all mimic lots of the classic symptoms of depression. But the field of psychoneuroimmunology was basically kick-started by two professors at my alma mater, University of Rochester. So in 1974, Bob Ader, psychologist, and Nick Cohn, an immunologist, collaborated on a study. Now, initially, they were looking at taste aversion, classical conditioning, like Pavlov's dogs ring the bell with the food, and then the dogs learn or develop drooling for food at the sound of the bell, even when food isn't present. They were doing a taste aversion study in rats where they gave them a drink of saccharin, so sweet water, and then gave them a shot of cyclophosphamide, which is a drug that causes nausea to discourage the rats from liking or wanting the saccharin. And what they noticed was that the, with this pairing, not only did they, that actually the rats that wound up consuming the most saccharin started dying and further investigation studies showed that, I mean, they knew to begin with cyclophosphamate isn't just a pro-nausea agent. It also is an active immune suppressant. And it turns out what they were doing is that they had used classical conditioning and trained the immune system to respond to a psychological cue or a physical cue, but the pairing was along the lines of psychological classical conditioning. So the rats learned when they got saccharin to suppress their immune system. And this at the time was considered novel because it felt that the immune system was completely this walled off system separate unto itself, but the fact that it's intimately connected with the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, and there's two-way communication between the two is quite important for mental health. So again, as I mentioned earlier, some of the studies that developed after this was injecting some of the cytokines, some of the interleukins and other chemicals produced by the immune system into people who were healthy, and you could produce not just some of the symptoms of depression, like greater negativity and hedonia social withdrawal, you could actually reproduce the full range of full-blown clinical depression. And then in the 90s, when interferon became a more widespread treatment for some cancers and for hepatitis C, interferon is a drug that often has widespread boosting of the immune system. That often triggered depression in up to a third of patients. Then there were 
a number of studies looking at people who have an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis and have depression at the same time, and giving those individuals an anti-inflammatory helped not just their physical somatic condition, the, the arthritis, but also helped with their depression, and it appeared to be safe. This has led to a smaller number of studies looking at whether giving anti-inflammatory treatment to people who are depressed but do not have a separate somatic inflammatory condition, whether that can work. And the studies were fairly mixed. Some studies found benefits, some didn't. At the end of 2025, a meta-analysis by, and I'm going to butcher the name, sorry, Nalis Mac Giolabui and colleagues at Harvard produced a new meta-analysis with somewhat clearer results. So again, the previous meta-analyses showed that individuals with depression but no somatic inflammatory condition, no bodily somatic no bodily inflammatory condition, anti-inflammatory treatment helped, and sometimes it didn't. Now, in this meta-analysis, they only looked at randomized controlled trials, and they looked at those where they had investigators actually had a specific cutoff for individuals who were under a high inflammatory baseline state and a low inflammatory baseline state. And the inflammation here was measured by CRP, C-reactive protein. So if levels of two or more, you were in the high inflammatory group. Levels below 1.5, I believe, you were in the low group. Using this high and low cutoff group, anti-inflammatory agents did reduce anhedonia symptoms and did reduce depressive symptoms. They did not find that there was a higher rate of response to depression or a higher response or higher remission rate of complete absence or curing of depression with this anti-inflammatory treatment, but there was, again, measurable, consistent symptom reduction, and it was particularly those who had the highest levels of inflammation to begin with were most responsive to this anti-inflammatory treatment. Now, this constituted fewer than 400 subjects, so this is not a large number. The treatments varied in length from 2 to 12 weeks. All of these patients were depressed. Some of them, only six of these studies, they only got an anti-inflammatory. The other 13 studies, they were given an inflammatory on top of their stable antidepressant treatment, so no switching of antidepressants were allowed during the study. The other thing is that of these 19 trials, five of them involved minocycline, which is an antibiotic that also is known to reduce inflammation in multiple different ways. It suppresses pro-inflammatory cells like the microglia. It decreases cytokine, certain messengers. It inhibits other key enzymes that are inflammatory and reduces oxidative stress. And another four of those 19 involve celecoxib. Celecoxib or Celebrex is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, but it's specific for the cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme. Most of our others like Ibuprofen, naproxen are COX-1 and COX-2 blockers, but these studies did involve a variety of other anti-inflammatory approaches as well. So you could say weakness of this meta-analysis is that it doesn't help us pinpoint which particular aspects of the immune system are most useful for targeting for helping reduce anhedonia. And as the authors themselves mentioned, C-reactive protein is used in a lot of studies as a general marker for overall inflammation. CRP, C-reactive protein, is a protein that's part of the immune response. It's made in the liver, and it can be response to just tissue damage. So if you have surgery, your CRP is going to go way up, even if you don't have infection complications or lots of inflam inflammation afterwards. We know that CRP is, at a group level, elevated in depressed individuals, and CRP levels are highly associated with levels of other inflammatory biochemicals in the body. So in some of the earlier studies, particularly, it was thought that your CRP is sort of in a fairly standard or stable range unless you're getting surgery or have an acute infection. But it looks like probably there's more variability in CRP levels outside of major infection and surgery. Two is that there is some association between body fat levels, adiposity, and C-reactive protein. So it could be confounded that we're looking at 
obesity as well as inflammation, but those again are correlated with each other. Other people have asked, you know, isn't this sort of cherry picking when we're looking at only studies which segregated people into high inflammatory states of baseline and low? And I'd say this, unlike some of the studies pretending that there's a connection between vaccines and certain bad outcomes, this study ahead of time identified what they were going to be looking at and what outcomes they were looking for. So it's hard to say that this was a cherry picking study. So also published last year in 2025, there was a study by Jonathan Savitt and colleagues at the University of Oklahoma and other institutions. This is looking more specifically at antidonia and depression and inflammation. So they looked at 68 individuals who were already depressed and they injected them with LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide. This is a trigger in many studies for inducing inflammation. So the component of gram-negative bacteria is largely lipopolysaccharides. So it's thought that this triggers an inflammation because the body's reacting to it as if it's gotten a massive bacterial infection. And they categorized their 68 individuals into either high responders, so those who had a CRP of three or more versus low responders, less than one or equal to 1.5. So two different groups, a high reactive inflammation and a low reactive. And the actual average group, averages of CRP turned out to be 7.4 versus 0.75. So almost a tenfold difference in how strong an inflammation response. So the inflammation response peaked at about an hour and a half after the injection. They measured several cytokines, including interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, and interleukin-10, and depressive symptoms increased in all individuals who got the lipopolysac, got the pro-inflammatory injection, but there was a substantially bigger increase in those individuals who had a high baseline CRP. They also showed a bigger increase specifically in interleukin-6 in the high baseline CRP group. As part of the infl inflammatory response, they actually didn't see a difference in tumor necrosis factor or interleukin-10. And then specifically, they looked at some other measures or aspects of depression. So there was no change from this injection of a pro-inflammatory injection, no change, no increase in confusion, no increase in global depression, no increase in tension, and fatigue changed somewhat, but it wasn't quite statistically significant. So they felt they had shown that the anhedonia was the specific component of depression that changed most strongly in response to a pro-inflammatory trigger. And that, again, it was particularly the individuals who already had a high level of baseline inflammation who were primed to respond more strongly to a negative stimulus with, again, greater immune system response and greater anhedonia. Other research or authors suggest that about a quarter of those who deal with depression are primarily depressed from because they have high inflammatory state. In this study, it was actually 40% of their depressed population who fit into the high inflammation category. So what this means for other conditions, so is anhedonia in schizophrenia, anhedonia in ADHD, like anhedonia in depression, presumably, but that hasn't been rigorously studied yet, and would cheaper, more readily available anti-inflammatories, like the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, again, like ibuprofen, also be effective in this way. There just aren't formal studies. Again, that would pose slightly higher risk of gastrointestinal complications. Non-steroidals also can affect liver and kidneys. Much more to be discerned, but we're making steps in sorting out what's going on in the immune system brain connection.